you're just working at too fast a pace. And this whole, you know, oh, how are you? Oh, I'm busy. Oh, I'm busy too. You know, and it's this whole badge of honour and it's it's not a badge of honour. You know, when, when you tell people how busy you are, basically you're telling them how unproductive you are. And that's not a discussion you, you need to be having. Um, you know, so now really with everything that's happening with COVID and lockdown and now is the perfect time to reframe your time and start thinking about these busy lifestyles we lead. Welcome to the Get Invested podcast, where we share great conversations with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know-how and where they invest their time, their skills and their money and the benefits that this has created. You see, the truth is that everyone invests every minute and every day we're investing our time, our skills, our energy and our money in something. Some of us are investing consciously, some unconsciously, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, and sometimes for no impact. Get Invested will help you to start living by design, not by default. I'm going to help you to make it happen, not let it happen. You'll hear the top tips on how you can live with conscious intent so that you can live more, work less, and leave a living legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, make the most of your investment journey, and ultimately, to be living your dream, not someone else's. More episodes can be found on iTunes or at bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. Thanks for listening, and now, let's get invested. Hi, Freedom Fighters. Are you always busy? Do you constantly feel time poor? As I talk about in my book, The Freedom Formula, we all appreciate that life is good here in the lucky country. We have the best of everything and more creature comforts than ever. We live in one of the safest, least populated and most affluent countries in the world, where high quality and affordable everything is right here at our fingertips. Houses, holidays, health, cars, clothes, schools, sport, entertainment, gadgets, games, you name it, we can have it all. Because everything's available, it seems we have to have everything now. And most of us do. So yes, life is good. But is good really great? Do you have the time to really enjoy everything you can and want to do? Or are you constantly feeling harried and hurried? Do you feel under constant pressure and stress trying to keep up with a world that keeps demanding more and more of you and seems to be running faster and faster? A world where having everything and keeping everything means working harder and longer to maintain it. This world's become a merry-go-round that has sped up so fast we're hanging on white-knuckled for dear life. We're running so fast and feel so exhausted that we're at the point of losing our footing, tripping and falling over, never to get up again as we're trampled by the stampeding herd. We have everything, but maintaining this is getting harder, and we just don't have the time or the freedom to enjoy it. We're so busy just doing, with every waking moment spent dealing with the constant barrage of urgencies and emergencies of the day, that we just don't have the time or the energy to think about tomorrow. In the words of author Richard Swenson, we no longer have any margin. In this sense, margin is the space between our load and our limits. It's something held in reserve for contingencies or unanticipated situations. Margin is the gap between rest and exhaustion, the space between breathing freely and suffocating. Nailing the insight that perfectly captures the illness of our age, Swenson goes further to argue that we must have some time to breathe. We need freedom to think and permission to heal. Our relationships are being starved to death by velocity. No one has the time to listen, let alone love. Our children lay wounded on the ground, run over by our high-speed good intentions. Who plundered those wide-open spaces of the past, and how can we get them back? There are no fallow lands for our emotions to lie down and rest in. And we miss them more than we suspect. Are you one of the many who outwardly pretends or kids yourself that life is good, but secretly despairs that you desperately need more margin? You quietly pine for more time and breathing space to enjoy all of the niceties that life has to offer. 
and more freedom to choose what you want to do when. But you feel trapped on the treadmill and fear that the minute you stop sprinting, the hard four trappings of your lifestyle will grind to a screeching halt. In the immortal words of one of my favourite Pink Floyd, Floyd songs, many of us have become comfortably numb. We're resigned to the fact that what we have now is as good as it gets, and because we're starved of margin, we just don't have the time or energy to find a way to get our childhood time and our freedom back. If only there was a way out. So what's your relationship with time? Is it your comforting friend or your constant foe? Do you forever feel like you've just never got enough? That everything is a constant race against time and that you could just never catch up? Like you're constantly chasing a train that's leaving the platform when you just can't run fast enough to jump on board. That the door to the comfortable time train ride is always just out of your reach. In the last few weeks we've talked about the importance of time. That fulfilment comes from giving back and giving freely to others without expecting anything in return. But you can only do this when you have the freedom of time on your hands. And in our Western world, you only have time on your hands if your income needs are being met without relying on you to produce it. We've talked about the need to invest your time now to use the time you've got to get your time back. The essence of what I call giving yourself plenty of TLC. That's tender loving care in the form of time, leverage and the magic of compounding returns. And we've talked about thinking about time not only in terms of urgency and importance, but also the third dimension of significance, where you're constantly asking yourself, what am I going to do today that will give me more time back tomorrow? To constantly read situations, that's R-E-A-D, by repeatedly eliminating, automating and delegating everything you do against the compass of your lifestyle goals and your values. And all of this has got me thinking, So today I thought we'd complete our focus on time by drilling down to the granular things that you can be doing on a daily basis to transform your life from time poor to become time rich. But more on this later. Before we do this, I'm going to challenge you by helping you to slow time down, or at least your perception of it, because our perception is our reality. According to the research of neuroscientist David Eagleman, we all have the power to slow down our perception of time. It revolves around the difference between clock time and brain time. Clock time exists outside of us. It's constant and indifferent to us. But brain time is shaped by our perceptions. Brain time can feel like it just flies by or drags on and on. Eagleman conducted an experiment where he dropped his subjects over the edge of a building so that they plummeted ten stories... <sighs> onto a safety net, and then made them guess how long their falls took. The fall guys all believed that they were falling for much longer than they actually were. This revealed that we experience time different in the moment than how we experience time on reflection, and this is the secret to us slowing down our perception of time. When we look back, our memories expand and contract in the memorable new discovery times which are recorded and remembered in our minds with a lot of vivid footage as our senses and awareness and chemical responses in the body, like adrenaline, etc., flood our systems so that we're totally alert, responsive, and we can learn from what's going on. Time feels like it's going in slow motion. If you've ever been in a car accident or a near miss, you know what I'm talking about. As mere milliseconds feel like they are taking forever as our lives flash before our eyes. Eagleman's experiments also found that repetitive patterns result in brain activity falling, while new things and novelty cause brain activity to spike. So if you want to slow time down and make your life feel like it's lasting longer and is more enjoyable, fill your days with as many novel and memorable experiences as you can. Every day, you need to give your brain a reason to wake up from mindless repetition and habitual behaviour so that it starts paying attention. Go skydiving, rock climbing, or learn a new language or a musical instrument. And the newness and changes don't have to be big. Just learn something new. Go a different way to work or when you go shopping. Put down the phone and read a book. Get up and walk somewhere different. Take a bike ride to work. Try a new restaurant or a coffee shop every week. Just mix it up. 
Start by challenging yourself to do something different every single day, no matter how small it is. You have the power to slow down your experience of time and look back on a life where you accumulate a multitude of life experiences and memories just by continuously breaking mindless routine and monotony. In this way, variety isn't just a spice of life, it's the secret to making your life feel longer. So let's explore some of the other ways that you can slow time down. Now, I don't know about you, but it definitely feels like the older I get, the faster time seems to slip through my fingers. Days and weeks seem shorter, and the years seem to disappear with ever-accelerating speed. Those endless summers of childhood have turned into a couple of months wearing work clothes sweating in the heat. Holidays just seem to come and go in a flash. I remember times in my childhood where it felt like time went slow enough to run out of things to do and actually get bored. Now, most people I know complain about not having the time to do the stuff they claim they want to do, but really never pursue. So an important piece of living well as I age that most people don't consider is taking advantage of the fact that time perception is a construction of our brains. By slowing down our perceived passage of time, we appear to have more of it and feel like we're living longer and better. In this regard, I want to challenge the dangers of the old maxim that time is money. Even if it is, if you take this approach to the extreme, you run the risk of missing out on enjoying life's little luxuries. Because increasing the perceived value of something is a two-edged sword, and it breeds a perception of scarcity. So when we think of our time as money, our time gets more valuable and more scarce. But instead of packing our schedules full of interesting experiences, many of us have the tendency just to work longer to make more money. Reading for pleasure becomes wasteful. Sitting down to dinner with the family is an extravagance you have trouble justifying. The time we do take as leisure becomes more harried with worry that we could be doing more. The reason that our time felt like a past so slowly when we were kids is partly because everything we were seeing, doing, experiencing, smelling, hearing and tasting is new. And learning and experiencing new things take up a larger portion of our memories. Our brains were working overtime to process an abundance of novelty. Each and every experience as as kids was fascinating. Compare this with the average adult working a 9 to 5 job. They get up at the same time every morning They eat the same breakfast, they take the same route to work, they sit down at their desk and perform the same tasks they performed yesterday, the week before and the year before. Everything's routine. The brain doesn't have to work to process any new information or remember the specifics. It's the same thing day in, day out. They can't really remember what they did one, two, three days ago. Not because they're going prematurely senile, because every day is the same and the brain literally doesn't see the need to retain the memory of each. This is precisely when days slip into months, into years, and before you know it, retirement's just around the corner. Doing the same routine every day barely registers in our brains. We just don't notice it. We don't remember doing it. As a result, entire days are lost. So rediscovering novelty and continuously challenging yourself to do new things is one of the secrets to slowing time down. And from where I sit, we've never been more productive. We've got dozens of high-tech tools to help us multitask and communicate with anyone at a moment's notice. We can find the most obscure bit of knowledge in seconds on Google. It's all saving us time, right? Except that we're working more than ever. And when we're not working, we're thinking about work, or we're turning our leisure time into work by trying to optimise it. We tell ourselves we're saving time. But few of us ever condense work to a few productive hours each day and then kick back and spend the bulk of our time enjoying the moment. It just doesn't happen. Instead, we just use our productivity gains to spend even more time working. And as our guest today emphasises... We need to avoid multitasking. Stick to the task at hand. Don't have so many tabs open on your laptop that the favour cons disappear, which I'm guilty of as I get lost down endless rabbit holes. 
Because multitasking only makes time perception speed up. And it doesn't even improve productivity as is revealed in our conversation today. We all know that the faster we move through space, the slower time unfolds. We see this in sci-fi movies about astral explorers aging more slowly on their interstellar journeys. But it also works on a local micro level, even if it's just barely perceivable. Try this out if you don't believe me. Spend a day on the couch binging the latest net- Netflix show. Watch an entire season of something you haven't seen before so that it retains that new novelty. Only get up to go to the toilet or the bathroom. Then, spend a day exploring your area, town or city on foot. Walk briskly, ride a bike, whatever you want. Just physically move through space without stopping. Which one took longer? Which was a fuller, richer day? They both introduced novelty, so the only difference was physical movement. Scientists have also discovered that our relationship to technology has sped up our perception of time. In a series of human experiments, researchers have found that people who are constantly connected to technology perceive time to flow faster. What was actually 50 minutes felt like an hour to tech addicts, who were more anxious and stressed about time running out than those who use technology less. So get disconnected. The next thing you can do to expand your enjoyment of time is to forward schedule your holidays and trips. Now this doesn't mean you have to plan everything down to the last detail. You don't have to decide now where to have breakfast on the sixth day. Knowing you have a holiday or trip away gives you something to look forward to. It extends and enriches the trip beyond the trip itself. You'll spend time in the run-up to the time away eagerly anticipating the trip. You'll enjoy the trip when you're on it, and you'll have the rest of your life to savour the memories. Throwing together a rough idea of the trip or destination several months out leaves plenty of room for improvisation, but it can really increase the density of your experience and thus slow your perception of time. And finally, get out into nature and don't wear a watch. I haven't worn a watch for years. Because most of us are slaves to the clock. In the wilderness... There are none. Rather than seconds and minutes out there, time is measured in seasons, sunrises and sunsets, and temperature changes. It's a much grander thing embedded in the landscape itself. That linear tick of a digital display pales into insignificance. This is something that I'm challenging myself to do more of. So how is time passing for you these days? Faster or slower? Now you know some other things that you can do to start help slowing things down. Now let's return to the age-old issue of getting your time back. Now I hate to break it to you, but being constantly busy is a choice. It may have become an unconscious one, but your level of busyness is ultimately about what you continue to say yes to and what you don't say no to or what you decide to distract yourself with so that you don't allow the time to think, because thinking could be confronting. But what if you could become time rich? What if there was a way to put 30 hours a month back into your life? Imagine how good it would feel to be able to stop and breathe freely and to create some much-needed but seldom-enjoyed guilt-free me time. This is exactly what today's guest Kate Christie helps you to do in her latest book, Me First. The guilt-free guide to prioritising you. And in today's timely discussion, we dive deep into unpacking all the ways you can simply and easily transform your time that is that discussed in Me First, as well as Kate's other books. Imagine what you could do if you created an extra 30 hours a month of free me time. That's nearly four days a month or nearly 48 days a year because this is exactly what Kate Christie can do for you. Kate's a time investment expert, an international speaker, and the best-selling author of four books so far. She works with big and small businesses, entrepreneurs, C-suite executives, educators, and government agencies on individual, team, and organisational productivity. She's a self-professed time styler, and she specialises in helping you to find more time. Kate has stepped 
thousands of people through her smart time framework and four lenses approach that we discuss in detail today. She's the time management expert for Koshi's Business Builders, which is Australia's leading small business TV program. And she's enjoyed multiple high-profile media appearances as a leading commentator on smart time management to ensure that you enjoy success across your career, your family, community and your life. In our engaging and energising chat today, you'll gain real practical and tactical advice that you can implement for immediate time gains. In her down-to-earth way, Kate educates us on better ways to choose how to live, work and play. On maximising our time so we can all live the life we love. But before we dive into the conversation, I'm going to challenge you with a simple daily exercise that will help you to create this free me time and put it to great use. Because there's no point freeing up your time if you're just going to work longer or worse still, waste it mindlessly finger flicking on social media or binging on Netflix. Now, they say you need to do something 64 times before you create a new habit. So I challenge you to do this every day for the next 13 weeks. Every morning when you wake up, hit the snooze button and do this quick, easy mental exercise. With your eyes closed, think about a time when you felt really good, a time when there was no time pressure. It may have been a great holiday. And really relive those feelings, really reconnect with how good it feels to have time on your hands. And feel it in every fibre of your body with a beaming smile on your face. Then start giving thanks for everything that's good in your life. For example, thanks for my life, thanks for my wife, thanks for my son and daughter, thanks for all the great times, thanks for all the time I have. Give thanks for everything, no matter how big or small, to really heighten that feeling of peace, tranquility, joy and contentment. And then mentally repeat this mantra, time free me, time free me time free me. As you imagine and really feel what it's like to have lots of good time on your hands. Now I know that many of you are probably now thinking, come on Bushy, this is all a bit weird and woo-woo, but stay with me here. I mean, what have you got to lose? Just spend your first five waking minutes in between the snooze button visualising and feeling how good it is to have lots of free time for the next 13 weeks and then just see what happens. Use your morning alarm as a trigger for you to do this. And then feel free to email me on bushy at khgroup.com.au in a couple of months' time to let me know how you go. From personal experience, I know that you're going to be shocked with the results because what you think about is what you bring about, but only if you stick to it consistently. And now, to start investing your time to get your time back, enjoy this entertaining chat with Kate Christie. Welcome back, Freedom Fighters. Now, as most of you know, I've always considered time to be our most important asset. It's a limited resource and the one thing that we never get back. So time can either be your biggest friend or your greatest foe, depending on where you invest it. And I believe strongly that you need to constantly invest your time today to use the time you have to get more of your time back. And there's never been a more important time to invest your time wisely. So that's exactly what we're going to do today in redefining time and how you make the most of it by tapping into the world's leading time styler, Kate Christie. So let's get invested, Kate. Welcome aboard. Thanks so much for having me, Bushy. I've been looking forward to this all week. Me too. Me too. I've been a big fan of yours for uh, quite a number of years, having uh, sat in the audience and listened to you personally. So, And I know you're going to share some awesome gold with uh, the audience today, given just how much of a struggle a lot of people have with time. But for those of uh, the listeners who don't know you, can you start by giving us a rundown on who you are, what you do, and where you're currently heading? Sure. So I am a time management specialist. I'm the best-selling author of four books, a global speaker, and a passionate advocate for how we need to start investing rather than managing our time. And very much focused on working with high-performing teams and high-performing individuals, be that across corporate, um, not, you know, for profit, local government, education, 
uh, small business entrepreneurs, wherever wherever there is a high performer, that high performer is not currently maximising how they invest their time. And once you start investing your time and investing it well, then as you know, Bushy, the sky's the limit. Absolutely, and the, you've touched on a couple of great subjects which I'm going to delve into in some detail later on the discussion around that v- really key distinction between managing and investing your time. But th- tell me, Kate, why do you do what you do? Well, I firstly, I love being in business. So I love having my own business. I love being my own boss. I love making the rules and setting the hours and so all of that I love. Uh, If you have people who are listening in who are kind of debating that whole do I or don't I, do I leave corporate, uh, do I invest and take the risk in myself, then I'm a wholehearted advocate for that. I'd say absolutely go for it. So that's, I guess, the number one reason why I do it. Secondly, it was about creating a lifestyle for myself and my kids that I love to give me the flexibility to be around them when I needed to, when they needed me, often when they don't want me or don't need me, or <laughs> that I know that I'm, I'm, I'm going to be there. Um, and thirdly, because based on my own experiences through my corporate career, uh, being a um, highly driven professional woman who then had three children in the space of three and a half years and had to try and manage that phenomenal juggle and ultimately making the decision to opt out of my career because I felt that I was failing at everything. Um, Being in that place and realising later that I'd made the wrong decision and that really If I'd known then what I know now about time and how to invest my time, I could have had it all. Um, But that was a sliding door moment and it it basically led me to a place where my focus now and my passion is to make sure that no one ever feels that they have to choose between two things they love for want of time. Mm, Well, you've jumped straight into a... uh a deep subject there, which I'm, I'm going to dig a bit more on as we go. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that if you don't mind because uh, yeah, of course. there's a lot in there and, and a lot of the struggles that you've just described are the sorts of struggles that most of the listeners have, have either been through or going through or will go through. So uh, let's park that for a minute uh, and come back to it because what I'd love to do, if you don't mind, Kate, is to go back as far as you would like to take us and uh, sort of paint the story of your journey so far in terms of where you've invested your time, your energy on your, and your money, what you've learned from it, where did that get you to and how did that lead, lead you to what you're doing today? Okay, great. So in terms of investing, I guess I've always been that very studious little girl, so she's kind of still in there, where it's always been important for me to work hard. Um, I think that was an ethic that was invested by my parents into me, that, you know, you have to work hard, you know, nothing is for free, and even the free things have got conditions attached. Um, But, you know, work hard and, and also... I guess my biggest successes and my biggest failures were, have been around that work ethic and also around the concept of, you know, my parents. I was a child of the 70s. Um, my parents brought me up and my two sisters up to believe that we were strong, independent, incredible women, that we could have it all and do it all and be anything we wanted. And I genuinely believed that and bought into that. And in a lot of respects, that became my biggest undoing from a corporate perspective. Um, so investing my time and energy has always been important since I was little. I guess in terms of money investments, uh, I made my first ever investment when I was 16 and I bought a piece of art. My parents were, and my dad still is, a, an art lover and we were kind of dragged around every goddamn gallery open known to man when we were little and it just 
really rubbed off on me. So I bought a piece of art when I was 16. I um, was decluttering the other day and I found the receipt for it. I paid $800 for this piece of art, which when you're 16 is a lot of money. And I still own that. I still own that. I have a beautiful art collection actually, but I've never, ever let that first piece go. Mm, let's dive straight in there because uh, you're the first guest that's come on board that has a real interest, passion in investing in art. So I'd, I'd love to go there if you don't mind. Um, mm. Talk to me about uh, clearly your was your father an artist or you, do you produce your own art or you just have a, a real passion for art itself? Yeah. So no and no, he he wasn't an artist, um, and I don't. I am. I'm definitely <laughs> not an artist. Um, <laughs> I, you know, struggled to I, – I, I would never be able to get past drawing a nose, you know. You, you just can't draw a nose. So um, I – look, they loved art. They were – my parents were both born during World War II, um, very much on the wrong side of the tracks in the western suburbs of Melbourne, which as, you know, things turn around, it's now, you know, one of the most affluent suburbs of Melbourne. So they were very, very asset-rich. And I, my dad is asset rich now, but um, because we grew up in the western suburbs, and um, but they always had a passion and a love for art, and and you know literally we I just remember weekends going around to art galleries, to small galleries, you know they would track down artists or Australian artists that they loved and write to them because back then obviously it was all by letters or get in touch with them and you know we'd get dragged off to all these god known places to to meet these decrepit old artists and <laughs> um you know and and mum and dad had, you know and, and and we'd have a cup of tea with them and stuff and i look back now god Love we were it. so lucky awesome. so lucky well, um, you would have got to meet some fantastic people because uh, creatives on that edge that are that are and let's face it I've, I've, you know i used to be an architect and I often used to say that architects are like artists. They they live on nothing while they're alive. They only become famous when they're dead mm. and uh, they spend their life creating stuff that a lot of people don't appreciate. Um, Absolutely. The, that love for art uh, that, that's developed in you, uh, what does art give you that, that continues that focus? I think it's, an, it's a real aesthetic pleasure. That's really what it comes down to. I... I, I, I did consciously buy that first piece of art as investment. Like I absolutely remember consciously thinking, I will invest my $800 in this piece of art and by the time I'm 50, it will be worth $50,000, <laughs> whatever. Um, and now I know, now know that that is just entirely wrong um, for many of the reasons why you've just said, you know, that artists that I could afford who are alive aren't going to be, you know, selling their works for the price that a Picasso is going to get. <laughs> so it really purely is an aesthetic sort of pleasure. And But art also, from an investment perspective, art will hold its price. And if you buy well, I guess it will, you know, you can make money out of it, but I've never done it from that perspective, apart from that very, very first purchase. Um, I've always since bought things that I love looking at, that I love having around me, um, the colour and the vibrancy. And, and plus, your, your, your tastes change. So, you know, when I first started buying art, it was um, art that is very different to what I now buy, you know, whenever I can afford a piece now. Um, you know, I'm more into sort of Aboriginal art now, which are and modern kind of modernist sort of art, which I never was back then. I was much more influenced by my parents, which was sort of women artists. You know, during the two world wars and between the the wars in Australia, that was kind of their their genre. And um, you know, that's all the stuff I love. Um, mm. But I love more probably now the more sort of the modern pieces. Yeah, love it. No, because I, I, I'm. Th- as an architect, we're sort of a closet artist in our own right. Mm-hmm. So that the sort of the visual arts is is something that I get a lot of joy and gratification out of. It just just gives me a good feeling, basically. Yeah. So, um, but t- tell me, sort of pivoting from there, because uh, what I've seen over the years, Kate, is that most people invest in their work or their career or their business, 
and they they tend to focus on the income side of the equation and but those that achieve real freedom and that's having time on your hands also invest in growth assets that effectively place their active work income with more passive income streams over time you've invested in art what what other growth assets do you or will you invest in uh, to achieve that sort of time freedom long term well, it's, I guess I've, I've, I've got a bit of a before and after scenario with this. Um, I was um, married for 22 years to my husband and we separated three years ago. So I, we kind of had a before strategy, which was around, you know, acquiring shares and property and we had a beach house and we had the art um, We've we never been kind of big car people or anything like that, but it was certainly um, a balanced portfolio, if you like. Mm-hmm. And then I have the post kind of me now, which was more around investing where I can maximise my time with my kids and provide us with a lifestyle and security and ongoing um roof over our head sort of thing um, in in a way where I'm not working all of the time. So, you know, I completely sold out my entire share portfolio so that I could put that onto a mortgage, um, a couple, you know, last year. Um, and, and, and coming from a situation where, you know, I was married for 22 years, I got married when I was in my early 20s, um, you know, that was all pretty sort of stark and, and scary. And, you know, I, I hadn't opened a bank account in my own name ever. Um, so there was that steep learning curve and it just gave me a very different perspective of investment and money. And really it's, it's about making sure that my kids and I are happy and, and safe and well and comfortable. Mm. Mm, yeah, no, uh, uh, the, certainly no point in eking out a, a miserable existence, uh, investing in things that are eventually going to get you. You've got to balance the equation by being able to enjoy today because that's all we have, but have something that's going to grow in value and sustain your uh, lifestyle long term. So, yeah, I completely understand the switch and, and having been through uh, a relationship split many years ago, it certainly forces you to reflect and and rethink about where your priorities are so let's talk briefly about that because it's probably reasonably fresh in your mind you you parted from your partner what do you think uh, led to that situation and and how have you sort of maneuvered through that since um oh it's been incredibly hard um you know you it's any of your listeners who have been through a separation um, when there's children involved, even if there's not children involved, it's it's incredibly um, emotionally impactful. Um, it's frightening. Um, it's financially impactful. You know, there's no two ways around that. Um, so it was phenomenally difficult. And obviously, as time passes, it becomes much, much easier. But you know, overnight, my priorities changed, um, my value set had to change, um, my focus, my energy um, changed, and, and, you know, your, your future changes too. You know, you you have kind of either certainty about what your future holds as a unit and as a family, um, either in a sort of you've got a written plan or you at least have a sense of this is what we're going to be doing together and and overnight that's all gone and so you have to um kind of rewrite the script and and you can't sort of do that immediately because obviously there's so much um pressure and and pain and emotion and fear involved but once that kind of settles then you have the chance to then think okay well what am I going to do differently and and what's my future now look like because it's now not as a unit it's a our family looks very different so what does that mean and you know I I don't know Bushy I think you kind of have to work through that forever don't you yeah I reckon it's a constant work in progress You, you mentioned your your values change which I find interesting can you elaborate on what your values were and what they've become and why 
Yeah, so I guess my when I talk about the values changing, one of the things that um, was really very um, sort of apparent and stark for me, and I guess interesting in terms of the context of speaking with you, is that we assume certain roles in our in our relationships and in, in our marriages, and you, you play to your strengths. And one of my um, weaknesses or an area where I had zero interest and um, very little um, curiosity and not wanting to explore was around our finances, around our investments um, and so forth. And so kind of overnight I went from a place where our financial kind of health and and strategy was completely outsourced to my husband and to, say, advisors or whatever, but... You know, I just would sort of, you know, nod and go with the flow because I had no interest in it. And overnight, that changed very quickly from something that I was very, very happy to outsource to something that I then had to upskill myself on very, very quickly. Um, and, and so I had to learn my numbers. I had to engage um, people around me. I had to obviously open bank accounts. I had to get a mortgage I had to understand our share portfolio and share strategy I had to understand um, you know where all the money was what was owed what wasn't owed I had to get a much better understanding of the money that went in and out of my business um, so you know the, my values changed and from that perspective and and I guess I was kind of in some respects I was sort of really just floating along you know I was just kind of floating along and um, it what the separation did was it really honed where do I have to invest my time. And I guess I had had a suite of values by which I would live my life and, and all of a sudden I, I honed them very succinctly down to three values. Um, and there were three things that I will get out of bed for or there's three things I love talking about or there's three values or behaviours that I exhibit. And so I, I got it down from, you know, my list of however many values and there are only three things I focus on now. And, and that was all as a result of the separation. And, and you've got me in anticipation there. What are those three values, Kate? So the number one are my kids. Anything to do with my kids is a Yes. And, and when I say with my kids, it means actually with my kids. So, um, you know, if it's a request saying, can you come and watch me play, you know, my 800th game of football this weekend, um, and I don't mean across my lifetime, I mean you're playing your 800th game this weekend because um, you've played 700 already this weekend, um, then it's a yes. But if it's a, Kate, can you be the treasurer of the football committee, then it's a no. Because that's it, got something to do with my kids, but it's not with my kids. Mm. Um, the second one is my business. If a request comes my way that has something to do with my business or um, growing my business or sharing my knowledge or helping people or talking business, it's a yes. And my third one is sort of health and, and well-being. So am I fit? Am I mentally in a good place? And that's the three things that my life revolves around. So, you know, I don't have a lot of time for friends i don't you know have a lot of things that i do i do my kids i do my business and i do my own sort of health and wealth uh, you know health and well-being um but i don't have i don't at the moment make time for anything else because they're the three values that guide everything i do at the moment love it now what i'm hearing there also is that there's a courage a strength and resilience that goes with are focusing on those three values that allows you to be able to say no to a lot of things that, that don't do that. Can you talk us through that? Because that, that's a real challenge that a lot of people have in 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 honouring those those values and not feeling the sense of guilt or obligation to say yes mm. to everyone else's needs. How, how have you tackled and navigated that? Look, I, I think part of it part of it comes with sort of age and maturity. Um, I think that as you get older, you're sort of more confident in your own skin and um, you know, I don't really care if um, <laughs> if it bothers you that I've said no. Um, I'll explain it and I'll, I'll be polite about it and, and I won't be rude about it, but I'm not going to lose any sleep if I think that um, you don't like me anymore. Um, so I guess there's that sort of confidence, if you like, and I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I just mean 
Um, I, I prioritise my kids, my business and our health. And if that means that I don't have the capacity and ability to spend 8,000 hours as the treasurer of the basketball committee, then so be it. I'm not going to feel guilty about that. Mm. Um, the other thing I'd say is that when it comes to investing your time, you have to be true to your values. You have to spend your day doing the things that are most important, be that your kids or family or extended family or your business or your career or, you know, having authentic conversations, whatever it is, you have to be true to those values. So, so when you have absolute clarity over those most important values, and for me it's three, by having absolute clarity over that, it makes it really easy for me to say no to everything else because that's just white noise. So I don't have to have that debate with myself. Will I or won't I? Should I or shouldn't I? Can I or can't I? It's just a simple no. Um, and it's always delivered politely, but, it, God, it makes life easy. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. You, you've got both a magnet and a compass right there because, you know, if you overlay that framework over every decision you make, is it is it helping me spend more time with my kids? Is it assisting my business or is it making me healthier and, and improving my well-being? No. Great, we're not doing it. Simple. Yeah. And it's it, getting to, the, and I'm, I, what I'm hearing here is that it's been some of those life challenges that you've been through that's actually helped crystallise uh, those values uh, that are important to you now. Let, let's face it, our values do tend to change and evolve over time based on where yeah. we're at in life. Yeah. But uh, it certainly, you know, do you, do you feel it was those challenges that's, that's really helped you crystallise uh, that approach, Kate? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I talk about that actually in my, my current book, that it, it's about, you know, understanding that your values do change depending on your circumstances and your life circumstances. But, you know, constantly sort of revisiting them or just tuning them, honing them, just to make sure that they're consistent with what, you know, the way you're currently living. Because, you know, if you're not living in a way that's consistent with those core values then you're going to be really unhappy and it's either because you're what you're doing is inconsistent with what you think your values are or your values need to be realigned um and and your values might not actually be quite right and 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 values is hard because often we have a sense of what we would like to be or how we would like to be seen and and, you know, you, you might think, oh, well, you know, I value fun. You know, I'd love to be known as a fun person. But if, you, if you're not fun, <laughs> and, then, and it's, you know, you, 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 there's no point in saying that's a value then. You know, it, it's got to be consistent. It's got to be true. Um, if if you, you love your business and, and you thrive on that and you often prioritise that over everything else, including, say, family, then you can't then sort of say, oh, well, my family is my number one value because it's inconsistent with your behaviours. Yeah, absolutely. I, I often say that uh, I can, I can, you give me a, a week with you and I'll tell you what your values are because it's where you invest your time. And you, and you might aspire and espouse uh, certain values of what you'd like to be, but the reality is your diary. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, now, I, I want to swing back, if you don't mind, because uh, you, you made a couple of very interesting comments uh, earlier on in that your work ethic was both uh, your biggest plus and your biggest minus. Uh, can you sort of, uh, in terms of your biggest successes and your biggest failures, all, all revolved around that work hard ethic? Can you take us through, uh, sort of, take us through what you mean by that in terms of where that evidenced itself in your in your working career and what the impacts were and, and where that's led you? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I, I guess you know, look, we all have our you know business and life successes, and 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 they're you know obviously wonderful and need to be celebrated, and the journey needs to be celebrated, but. I'm a firm believer that our greatest learnings, uh, our life-changing learnings come from the lessons we learn when we feel we've failed or we've perhaps not achieved. And I, look, I don't have a problem with saying the word failure. Um, it's, it, it, I know we could debate this, you know, 
all, all afternoon. <laughs> but I'll use that terminology just because it's kind of simple and yeah. it's it's only me reflecting on my life, right? Agreed. So, yeah. Um, but that whole work ethic of, of you know, working, you know, being raised to believe that, look, if you are very, very driven um, and if you have a modicum of talent and you work very, very hard, then you can have anything you want. And that was kind of the, that was kind of my philosophy, like right through school, through uh, you, high school, university, into my career, hard work plus a bit of talent plus phenomenal drive and I could have whatever I wanted. And, uh, you know, I didn't falter on that journey at all. So that was kind of all of the successes, if you like. Um, but then, you know, things really became or started to wobble or come unstuck when I um, – had my kids and I went from um, I had three children in three and a half years, which was absolutely entirely my own fault. Um, <laughs> but a lot of fun having them. I know, yeah, I really should have worked out what was happening after at least the second one, but there we were. Um, and I didn't adjust my philosophy, you know, hard work plus a bit of talent, a lot of drive, and I could have whatever I wanted. And and it doesn't work that way well for me it didn't work that way and so there was a sort of a period of time where I sort of had to you know rage at the world and you told me I could have it all what happened you know that sort of um uh doubt and Mm. and frustration and um you know the whole kind of motherhood ceiling thing you know that whole work-life balance and take time out to look after the kids and, you know, every connotation that you can possibly imagine I had, you know, some time at home, some time at work, you know, working remotely. I used to drive home from work with one of my kids um, who was at the cra- at creche and I would drive home at lunchtime every single day to breastfeed him so that he would go back to sleep and then I'd go and work from home. I mean, it was insane wow. some was of the it- stuff that you do because you want to be the perfect mum and the high-achieving career woman and the I can have it all and I can do it all and it's all right, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. And, you know, at some point, you sort of realise that you're actually drowning. And so that's what I mean by that, I guess, that work ethic and that sense of of wanting to achieve, be the best I could be in all facets of my life and that sense of I can have it all, I can do it all. Take us to that moment because uh, I've had a similar moment myself and, and the ethic that you've just described was exactly me uh, up until my uh, mid-30s when I had a... a a car crash, effectively, or a life car crash, uh, because you become a victim of your own self in that regard, uh, of your own expectations of yourself, which is that I think you know what's between the ears is the biggest challenge in all of that, regardless mm. of what's happening outside. But can you take us to that point where where you hit that moment when it was just all too much? Where were you? What you were doing? Uh, and I'm assuming you're with Telstra at that stage in the as an employment lawyer. Is, is is that round about the time that that occurred, Kate? Yeah, so I was I was uh, working at Telstra, but I moved out of law and I was um, a senior executive um, working in a really high position um, at that point in time. And I, I remember, obviously, you know, nothing happens instantaneously, so there was a lot of kind of build up. Yeah. Um, to that moment, but I do absolutely recall without question the exact moment. Um, so picture this, if you will, Bushy. Um, there I was in my beautiful black suit, my high heels, my red lipstick, looking a million bucks, <laughs> uh, decided to drop my son at school because I was a superwoman and a super mum and other parents do this so I can do this and got to school and it was cupcake day and um, there I was not a cupcake in sight I completely missed that memo Um, and I had snot from the corner of my shoulder down my leg with the hysterical child clinging to me all the other parents uh, standing around with their trays of cupcakes looking at me with 
absolute disdain. <laughs> um, the kind teacher sort of extricated my hysterical child from me. I fled to the car, um, burst into tears, rang my mum and said, Mum, you have to go down to the supermarket, buy some cupcakes and a paper plate, take the cupcakes out of the plastic, put them on the plate, bang them up a little bit, make them look like we made them take them down to the school. Um, so she did all that. I'm in the car just radiating guilt, thinking about the 25 years of cupcake therapy that my child's going to need. And I dashed into my first meeting of the day late, covered in snot, um, <laughs> clearly having been crying. And it just went completely silent around the boardroom table. And everyone looked at me and then they looked at their watches and they looked back at me, and I had this profound realisation that I was the only member of the executive leadership team that didn't have a full-time wife. And that was the moment. So that's a very subtle way of saying that everyone else around the table was male. Yep. As a matter of fact, they were. Mm, and, and, and clearly uh, a complete lack of empathy and a, a large dose of judgement there around well, expectations. Well, Perhaps, perhaps not. I, I certainly, that was my read at the time, but I was, my headspace was skewed at that time. So maybe they had a huge degree of empathy. Um, I don't know. I, I, I can't mm. really say. Mm. All I know that is from my perspective, I was absolutely judging myself. Mm, and, and I'm hearing a lot of uh, guilt feelings, G guilt to the other mums and, and your kids because you'd let them down, guilt uh, in relation to uh, what you perceived as what you needed to contribute in your corporate career. Uh, what happened from there? What, what, did you give it away? Talk us through what happened from that because that's a, that's a fairly major turning point. Yeah, so I guess it, I just, you know, from there um – that whole self-doubt started to really creep in. Um, you know, I was just much more aware of, of it. Um, I was judging myself big time. Um, I felt like others were possibly judging me, but I have no evidence of that at all. Um, I had a very healthy dose of imposter syndrome. Um, both in terms of my career and being a mum. You know, am I a good mum? What are the other mums doing? Um, I remember my kids and my son telling me, you know, I was going to, I was, it was sports day was coming up and, you know, mum, are you going to come to sports day? And it was, oh, you know, I'll see if I can get there for the end, you know. And, and just, you know, every single decision that I was making at that time brought a sense of guilt with it. You know, it was like, oh, I'll, I'll just give them a lunch order today. Oh, guilt, you know, crazy stuff. And um, so, you know, and I, I, I don't know the timeline. I don't recall the timeline. I do remember that sort of shortly thereafter I made the decision to opt out. I felt that I'd kind of backed in myself into a corner where I could either have a brilliant career or be a brilliant mum but not both. Mm. Um, and I felt like I wasn't doing either very well. I was letting my job and my employer and my colleagues down. This is how I felt. I was letting my kids down. And, you know, when you, you're not sort of satisfied with your effort or your outcomes in the, those two most important facets of your life, then you're obviously not going to be very happy with how you're living your life. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I opted out. Um, I turned to sports day a week later um my kids were in gym which was red and i'd learnt the whole you know gym is hot hot to go h-o-t-t-o-g-o -T -T -O -O. you know i had the song i had the pom-poms i completely wore red mate i was going to turn up and i was going to show those other mums here she is she can do it too you know what bushy i got there i was the only parent there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you little bastards, you've been lying to me. Love no it. one comes to sports day. <laughs> I gave up my job for this. I gave up my job. Um, so, and look, you know, but again, it was a massive, massive, massive learning for me because what 
became really apparent after a period of time, a short period of time, was that it was I was bored. I didn't want to just be a mum. I, I absolutely value and applaud people who are stay-at-home parents. It wasn't for me. Um, I needed something more. I needed something else. But I did not want to go back into corporate because it was way too inflexible for me. I'd already learned that lesson. Um, and this is 20, you know, this is 20, oh, not 20, 15 years ago. Yeah. So things have changed a little, not enough in my view. Um, but that wasn't an avenue. It wasn't an option for me. And that's when I decided to design and create a business. So, you know, again, it's a sliding door from, you know, your lowest point in your career comes the opportunity to live your greatest career. So, you know, there's no sort of failure from that perspective. It's all just lessons and you learn the best and the most from those low moments. Love it. And uh, let's talk about that then because uh, and I, I love the word design because there's intent there. Uh, you're, you're deliberately investing your time in something that uh, you believe in, you're good at and and a message that you want to take to help the world. Uh, talk Talk to us about what that is, because I'm, I'm guessing that's leading into being the world's leading time styler. And, and I, I guess just as a coming back from that, let's talk about time a little bit, because I'm assuming that moving into what you're now doing, uh, you know, investing your time well was something that you did naturally pretty much through the course of your life. Am I right in saying that? Or, or just tell us why time was a thing that emerged as a thing that you wanted to be the... The, the leading time styling guru on? Well, it, it sort of came about in a, a funny way. So um, time stylers is actually my second business. And I think I hear this a lot from my cohort and people I speak to that it's sort of like your second business that does really well, that you sort of make your mistakes with the first one um, and then you have a great second business. Well, it's certainly been the case with a lot of people I, I talk to. It's taken, um, me, taken me four businesses, but that's another story. I'm a sli- <laughs> I must be a slow learner, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. You're just, you know, perhaps just slow to find your passion, Bushy. <laughs> Sorry, I grew up. Go on. No, no, no. So my first business was 100% solving for what I needed at the point of my exit from corporate, which was I, I basically needed that wife, right? So... I started up an online business called Babysitters and More and it was connecting busy people, professionals and business owners and whatever, with home helpers. So I needed the nanny and the housekeeper and the cleaner and the dog walker and the gardener and all that sort of stuff. So that's the business I started up. Um, and I, I, that business is closed now. I, I ended up closing that last year because Time Stylers had kind of far outstripped it and in terms of both revenue but also in terms of my passion and my my enjoyment Mm. um but from that role or from that particular business what happened was that i was then in touch with a whole heap of other predominantly women just like me these women ringing up these high flying highfalutin high performing women who were absolutely falling apart at the seams you know they were like a a, an army of ducks, you know, just gliding across the surface of the pond and our legs were furiously working underneath. And I realised, oh, my God, there's so many of me out there. And, you know, they'd ring me in tears and say, you know, I need, you know, I, I've got a meeting, I've got to get on a flight for Sydney tomorrow and my husband can't take the day off and I need someone to look after my kids and they'd be freaking out. And that was what I, the business was. That's what I solved for. Um, now, what la- what happened, though, was I got to know a lot of these women really, really well. Um, some of them were, you know, phenomenally high-performing women, you know, CEOs, C-suite executives. Um, and because of the nature of what I was recruiting for, um, being home help, I, they kind of would share everything with me, you know, warts and all, in terms of these are really the hours I work. And, you know, my child has these sort of conditions or you know, some learning issues or maybe they've got some disabilities or anaphylactic or, you know, this is what happens with our dog. And it was like warts and all. Like you you had this immediate sense of trust with these women because Mm. they have to tell you exactly what their scenario was so that I could find the best person to help them. Of course, Councillor Kate. Um, 
that's it. So all of a sudden I'm getting all of this stuff and I'd say, well, try this, try that. And, and, and these women would read me and say, oh, my God, you know, you, I can't believe, you know, I didn't think of that myself and you've solved my life and, oh, my God, you know. And what it just became really apparent to me was that I, I didn't know anything they didn't know. I just had the headspace and the time to think about it. So I, in, in opting out of my career and realizing that time was an issue for me, I then spent time kind of reframing my own time and thinking, well, how could I be doing things differently? And, and that morphed with what all these women were telling me about their problems and what their lives involved, kind of just created this perfect storm. And I thought, look, I'm going to write a book about this. Um, I know there's a market for it. I know there's a lot of women out there who are in exactly the same position as me because they're ringing me and telling me I've got all of this sort of data and case studies and information. So I wrote my first book all around the framework that I designed to fix up my own time and set it out so that other woman, women could read it so they could fix up their own time. And it became a bestseller and that's, it all came from there. So that was when Time was born. Um, that's when I, you know, started working with men and women to help them reframe their time because I've had the headspace to think about it. Yeah, and there's there's a key piece, the, creating the, the headspace uh, it, because it's, you know, a lot of hard-working Australians wear the busy badge as a as, as some misguided form of achievement, whereas I've yeah. al- always thought the opposite, that if you've allowed life to overcome you to the point where you you don't have a living second, where it, it's, you, you don't have that headspace, yeah. then, then yeah. that will have its consequences long-term. It, it does. I mean, it, it results in burnout. It results in fatigue. It certainly results in a lot of unhappiness. Um, and then, you know, you get all that other stuff like the imposter syndrome and the guilt and the judgment because you're just working at too fast a pace. And this whole, you know, oh, how are you? Oh, I'm busy. Oh, I'm busy too. You know, and it's this whole badge of honour and it's it's not a badge of honour. You know, when, when you tell people how busy you are, basically you're telling them how unproductive you are. And that's not a discussion you, you need to be having. Um, you know, so now really with everything that's happening with COVID and lockdown and now is the perfect time to reframe your time and start thinking about these busy lifestyles we lead. You know, as we go out of COVID eventually, you know, do your kids really need to be doing those 850,000 after school activities that they do? <laughs> you know, do they honestly need to be doing Irish dancing, lacrosse, football, cricket, and rock climbing on a Saturday? Um, you know, you need to be doing all these things. So now is the perfect time to kind of redesign and think what's BAU version two going to look like? Mm, mm, yeah, I love that. And that's a perfect pivot to talk in more detail about the fourth book that you've just released, Me First, The Guilt-Free Guide to Prioritising You. Let, let's let's uh, talk about some of the, the key messages in the book, Kate, uh, that will be of interest to the listeners and, and perhaps even if you're happy to do so, sort of break down some of those frameworks and templates into specific things that uh, people can do in terms of thinking differently and doing differently. Yeah, yeah, great. So... Um, the, the book is broken into three parts. So the first part is very much around some of those crazy beliefs or belief systems that we buy into as working parents, particularly working mums. Um, but the book is absolutely as valuable and as a, a resource to working dads. Um, you know, things like imposter syndrome and guilt and judgment and you know, doing it all myself because it's just faster if I do it myself and, you know, all this sort of crazy stuff. So the first section really forces you to read and I guess reflect on your own belief system and the, some of the self-talk that we do and and to confront some of that. Um, as high achievers, as, as people who are either running their own business or they're, you know, working hard in their job or they're thinking of, transitioning from corporate to running your own business you know you're amazing you're incredible and and so we've got to sort of challenge that sort of self-doubt 
a little bit. So that's what the first section's about. Um, the second section is all around my five SMART steps, SMART's an acronym, um, and, and a series of exercises for each step that will result or reach get you to a point where you will get back 30 plus hours of lost time a month. Wow. Um, so if you do the exercises right and you invest your time in doing them, you will get back that time. Um, so step one, self-aware, which we've sort of touched on today. It's all about understanding your core values, but it's also about understanding what your time pressure points, what are your pain points at the moment. So just sort of going, going to getting that uh, line in the sand. Step two is map, where you map out a couple of days so that you can see exactly where you're spending your time, and that's phenomenally data rich. Yeah. Uh, step three is uh, analyze, so you categorize each task from your timesheets into something that you must do, something that you want to do, um, something that could be delegated or something that could be rejected. And the delegation reject sections or pieces are where you're going to find all of the gold of your lost time. Uh, step four is reframe. So that's where you make some decisions about exactly what you're going to delegate and what you're going to reject. And delegation falls into a couple of camps. We've got the traditional kind of delegation at work. On the home front, delegation falls into two categories. You've got outsourcing, which is where you identify everything that you do that you're prepared to pay an expert to do because they'll do it faster, better, and cheaper than you. So cleaning, for example. Yep. Um, and then the, the other type of delegation on the home front is insourcing, and that's where you identify everything you currently do for the people that you live with that they can do for themselves <laughs> that you don't have to pay them for. Love it. Clean your floor drobe, pick up your toys, put your stuff away, put your dirty clothes in the wash, put your clean clothes back in the cupboard, make your bed, hang up your towel, unload the dishwasher. Love it. Um, the rejects uh, fall into two categories. You've got total rejects and partial rejects. So total rejects we all have. Um, there's a massive one that we all have um, and it, that, it robs you of time. It's just stuff you don't need to do. Um, then there's partial rejects which are things that you do need to do, but you could be smarter about how and when you do them. So things that perhaps you could do at different times or that you could automate or systemize. Um, and then the last step is take control. And that's where you actually, the rubber hits the road, you implement the changes that you've decided you're going to make in terms of your day and your time, um, where you're going to be spending and investing your time versus where you're just not prepared to invest your time anymore because the cost is too high. Mm, mm, I love that. that. That's an awesome framework. That's part two. What, what, what yeah, does part, part three then do? Part three is a goal-setting framework. So it's around, okay, now that you've got your 30-plus hours back, where are you going to use that time? Let's set some audacious, awesome goals for the next five years so that you're using that time. I don't want you to get 30 hours back to just spend another 30 hours on email mm. or on Facebook or you know, learning a TikTok dance. Um, I, I want you to invest that time in identifying what your long-term goals are across your health, your wealth, your lifestyle, your family, your career, your business, and then start implementing, using those lost 30 hours to implement and get motivation and momentum towards achieving some of those awesome life goals. Yeah, it's brilliant. That encapsulates the whole thing. It's 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 looking at me and who I am and what what do I actually do. It's giving you a framework to then then look at everything you do and decide: do I do it? Do I get someone else to do it? Do I outsource it to others and pay for it? Or do I <coughs> insource it to the family and get them to step up and share the load? Uh, and then taking control of that uh, around a framework that that helps you to actually enjoy the things that you've been feeling like you've been missing out for years that's a that's a uh, brilliant approach are there, there any uh, specific uh, things that you're happy to share from the book that uh, would be immediate takeaways for the the listening audience right now in terms of uh, investing their time better yeah look so a couple of of big rejects um and you know what bushy we're going to play a game so I want right. to demonstrate this to <laughs> you and your audience. And so your audience can play along, okay? So when I say go, I want you to count out loud as fast as you can from 1 all the way through to 26. Go. 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. <laughs> I whispered and mumbled, but we got to 26. You did it. You did it. Well done. You can count. Okay. <laughs> Number two, this time when I say go, I want you to out loud as fast as you can the whole alphabet. Go. A, B, C, D, E, F, T, H, O, J, K, L, M, N, P, Q, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Excellent. Excellent. There was a funny R in there somewhere. Oh, but there's I some pretty that's funny mostly, stuff in there, let me tell you. That was mostly the alphabet. I, I sound a bit like that uh, dog off one of those cartoon shows. Uh, yeah, but uh, let's, let's not go there. <laughs> All right. Round number three. This time when I say go, I want you to do 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, all the way through to 26Z, go. 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, 5E, 6F, 7G, 8H. Yeah, okay, give it away. Okay, all right. (laughs) I got your point. I got your point. I'll put you out of your misery. (laughs) The biggest total reject of all is we cannot multitask. Oh, I love that. You've just made my day, Kate. Oh yeah, because I because my wife uh, uh, she and I, I think uh, women have this amazing ability to juggle a thing multiple things way better than guys do. Uh, but I'm a I'm a one horse pony. I do I do one thing extremely well, but you throw a few things at me and forget it. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Exactly. And look, I'll debunk the myth. Women aren't better at men than this. Uh-huh. Um, there's only 2.5% of the world's population can actually multitask, and they're so rare, they're called supertaskers. Well, she's a supertasker then. She, she is one of the 2.5%, but uh, I, I, you've given me <laughs> great gratification in saying that because uh, I'm going to quote you on that, Kate. Yeah, absolutely. And, and research, it's really interesting. Now, look, my one rider on it is that – it's for the strategic kind of hard, impactful work. You can only do one thing at a time. Um, you know, if you can cook the spaghetti bolognese while vacuuming the floor and kicking the dog and feeding the cat and yelling at the kids and painting the roof, you know, knock yourself out because <laughs> that's not your kind of your hard value, high value, hard strategic tasks. Um, for your high value, hard strategic or work type tasks, you can only um, the only solution is to single task. And when we try multitask, which can be as simple as having your screen on with your emails flashing in the top right-hand corner all day or your phone in your pocket vibrating or having multiple tabs open or multiple screens on your desk or allowing interruptions, can I have five minutes of your time? They're all examples of multitasking. And if or when we do that, our productivity goes down by 40%. 40%. Yeah. So if you're doing that all day, every day, and, and doing those sorts of – or having those sorts of behaviours all day, every day, then at best you're only ever working to 60% of your productivity or of your capacity. So that is the number one total reject. Yeah, and there's also so, the recalibration time. I, I know that uh, – you because know, people know me. I give off this aura of you – know, you know, excuse my French – piss off until, until we've allocated the time to talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I get right into the zone and that's where I do my best work when I'm totally focused. Absolutely. But as soon as I get interrupted, it mm. takes me a while to get back into the into the zone. Into have the you, zone. What have you yeah. found in, in that regard? Are there any, oh, any... That, without question, without question. Um, as professionals working in um, an office-type environment, um, we're interrupted around every eight minutes, all day, every day. And each time you're interrupted, it takes you up to 23 minutes to return to the point, the thing you were focused on at the point of the interruption. Because often we'll take on two different tasks before we return to that original task. So you're 100% right in saying that when you're in the zone, you're in the zone. When you're interrupted, it's taking you about 23 minutes to get back in the zone. In the meantime, you've already been interrupted another three times. So you're not getting any work done. Exactly. Yeah, I'd, I'd... Absolutely love that. That's uh, that's very useful in terms of uh, uh, moving that forward. Uh, tell me, in our current exercise, where a lot, and this is, I think, a, a great thing. You know, we've been working remotely for 
the years because it's a lifestyle business for us, but a lot of people mm-hmm. are coming to grips with working from home yeah. and uh, it's very easy to allow yourself to be distracted by patting the dog or hanging out the washing or I'll just do those dishes before I do this. Mm-hmm. How yeah. do you? What do you say to people who are starting to come to grips with this in terms of uh, uh, you know, effectively using the time uh, more efficiently in that regard? Yeah. Well, you, you need to start off with a really smart to-do list, so a master to-do list. So have a weekly master to-do list. Um, create that preferably on a Friday night if you love closing the week or a Sunday night um, to start the week. Don't do it on a Monday morning, um, and I'll tell you why in a minute. You take your master to-do list, you identify the two most important things you have to do on a Monday, on Monday, and you lock them into your calendar as a deadline because our brain loves deadlines. Now, you've already said you work best, you know, when you're in the zone, you want to get the work done. So you take those two most important tasks and you lock them into a point or a time in your calendar when you know you're going to be in the zone. So if you're a morning person, you want to build like a six-foot-high bulletproof fence around that morning um, time and not be interrupted and do your two most important tasks that on that day. Um, for that day at that time. And then over the week, you just revisit and update your to-do list, lock in the two most important things for Tuesday and then for Wednesday. Once you've locked those into your calendar, then the other thing you need to do is build in some breaks so that you, when you're working from home and in the office, you know, you want to get up and have sort of 10 to 15 minute breaks between each sort of 45 minute to hour bursts because your day is a series of short sprints. It's not a marathon. Um, set the timer and work to those sprints and then you're going to batch your time. So batch into your calendar. Batch If you're a morning person, batch out the morning with your highly valuable, high-performing tasks, your strategic tasks. Um, Batch out the afternoon for your process-driven type work because you're more likely to be tired and sluggish. So do your process and batch your stuff in there. Um, Batch in time that you're going to go and put the dishwasher on or the washing machine on. Um, you know, batch in when you're going to have your lunch. Um, batching is just the concept of locking out chunks of time in your calendar to complete things in one go. So, you know, like it, when you talked about it in the zone or being in flow. Um, so if you batch your calendar, you can still fit in all of those kind of incidentals, but you just do it in a much more kind of um, rigorous way, if you like. Yeah, and no, I love that. And it, it's something, uh, again, my uh, super tasker uh, partner, Sonia, uh, has, has helped our business with, and that is that we, rather than operate on a to-do list, to do list, we operate on a to-do diary. And yep. everything's got to be in the diary because you're actually allocating a time for that particular task. And it, what it very quickly does visually, because we work on a weekly diary, process is and we color code it so we have red blue black Perfect. so yep. you know red is admin stuff uh, uh, black is the productive stuff with clients and blue is the business development strategic yep. stuff that we do and and very quickly you you can it gives you a picture because you, we do this at the the end of the week after our mm-hmm. team meets and we can yep. tell uh, what we're actually going to achieve. We, we actually do three things a day rather than two, and I, I, something I'd like to jump straight into there is is why two? Look, if uh, two because it's easy and simple, and if you're starting out on this stuff, then it means that you can generally, if you're, say, a morning person, you can have two batches of, say, an hour in the morning interspersed with enough breaks and t- one batch of kind of email time to get you through to like a reasonable lunch hour. Mm. Um, If you're more advanced with this, which sounds like you and Sonia are, then absolutely um, I would try and batch in those key tasks. But what I would say is that the benefit of doing the two most important tasks rather than the three most significant or important tasks, whatever you want to call them, Mm -hmm is that you can do them during periods when you have your high energy. When, unless you're, you know, Superman and, and very lucky if you are where you are energetic all day, um, you need to batch in time for the low-value tasks. Um, that you know, when you're sluggish and tired, you know, it's very hard to do your three key high-value tasks in, in, a, in a day because there's going to be part of one of those tasks will potentially suffer for want of energy 
um, enthusiasm, um, endeavour, creativity. So that's why I tend to stick with two. Yeah, I love that. Talk to me, uh, talk to us, sorry, about uh, the, the five-time lens that you talk about in, in your previous books uh, in terms of how to assess and look at things differently. I, I just think that's a really useful framework as well, if you wouldn't mind yeah, sharing with so us. Ab- about the, the cost lenses, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's four different costs that you need to consider when you're – um, investing your time and it just helps you make that decision around is this the absolute best use of my time at any given time so there's four different cost lenses the first is financial cost your time is money uh, if you uh, work in a business or, or a profession where your time is charged out by the hour to your clients then it's easy that's your hourly rate and that's the rate that I want you to apply to everything you do so if you're a lawyer and you're charging your clients four hundred dollars an hour then that's the rate you should apply to, say, if you're spending an hour on admin or you're spending an hour cleaning your house on the weekend. You spend that hour, that's a $400 clean. Now, if you don't earn or if you don't charge out by the hour, one of the best ways I've found to identify or to calculate a sufficiently accurate hourly rate is there's an app online called the Harvard Meeting Calculator. Um, and it guides you through how to work out exactly and very quickly exactly what your hourly rate is based on your remuneration. So once you know your hourly rate, you need to apply that to everything you do. And if financial cost resonates with you, then this is this is the cost lens you should look through. And if your time is worth $50 an hour, you spend an hour a day every day on social media, that's $18,250 of your time a year. Love you know, it. Is this the best use of my time? The second cost lens which resonates with a lot of people, is opportunity cost. So the cost of the trade-off, the cost of um, what you've lost, what opportunity have I missed out on for spending my time in this way? So if I spend an hour a day on social media, is that an hour I could have spent talking to a client, winning a new client, delivering to a client, developing a new product, um, working on my strategic plan? So that's your opportunity cost. The third cost lens is emotional cost. Um, how do I feel? Do I feel good or bad about how I've just spent my time? Um, this one will often play out in your house on the weekend when you're yelling at your kids to help you clean the house and it's a house, not a hotel, and I'm your mum, I'm not a slum. <laughs> um, emotional cost. And then the final cost lens is physical cost. Is anything I'm doing making for pain? So if I'm sitting in front of my computer in isolation on back-to-back Zoom meetings and I'm not standing up and I'm not getting a break, is my back going to hurt? Um so one of those four lenses will resonate more strongly with everybody than, than any of the others. And as a listener, you just have to work out which of those resonates with you. And that's the lens you want to look through from now on every time you catch yourself doing something or you um, are halfway through a task. You know, classic for me, Bushy, as you well know, I am an absolute technophobe and I give off this like radiation aura that breaks computers any time I get near them. So, you know, I, a couple of weeks ago, I found myself like 20 minutes into trying to work out a computer problem of my CRM. And I, I just called myself, and thought, what the hell are you doing? You know, you're completely doing everything you tell everyone not to do. Um, this is not the best use of my time. This is something I should be outsourcing because I'm not a computer expert. I'm, you know, a computer killer, let's face it. (laughs) Um, So it's just about looking through those lens. And for me, it's either financial cost or opportunity cost because I'm always thinking about my time as money and I'm always thinking that there probably could be something better I could be doing with my time right now. Yeah, I, I, I love that. It, it covers covers all of those, and I think the emotional cost is one that I hadn't thought about until until you mentioned it. Because everything we do uh, with our time has an emotional feeling attached to it, and if we start to recognise that and uh, honour that, then it means that if we're directing our time effectively, we're we're keeping ourselves in a our happy place. Absolutely. It's just a different level of consciousness. You know, that's the whole, you know, if I work back late again tonight, I'm going to miss seeing my kids before they go to bed. That's the whole arguing over who's going to do what chores and who's, you know, going to do a different chore. That's the whole, you know, missing out on sports day and being the only parent who doesn't go to sports (laughs) day stuff. You know, it's it's the emotional impact, which is massive. Massive. And it it, it circles back to that, you know, the first, uh, that, part of the smart steps in being self-aware of that 
uh, which yeah. I think is pretty key. Hey, um, something I'd, I'd love to quickly talk about as well is, uh, you know, we constantly hear about work-life balance and mm-hmm. uh, I don't want to cover the conversation too much, but I, I just reckon that's bollocks. Uh, <laughs> what's, what's your view around it and, and how does uh, what you do to help people sort of feed into that? Yeah, look, I agree. Work-life balance is the biggest bloody PR spin of all time, isn't it? I mean, it's <laughs> honestly, if I read another glossy corporate brochure that tells me um, with a smiling face of a young dad on the cover that they are so great at work-life balance, I think I'll poke my eye out with a stick. <laughs> um, you know, there is just no such thing, okay? You, you, It's life. You work. It's part of your life. You've got a family. They're part of your life. You engage in other pursuits and community and volunteering and creating wealth in spending time with your friends and family. It's all just life. And so it's about integrating life. It's about making sure that you're making time and investing your time in all the things that are most important to you, which again then circles back to those values. You know, my kids, my business and my health and well-being. Um, You know, I need to integrate all of those to make sure that I'm living um, my best possible life. Can I balance them? No, I'm not a bloody circus performer. I mean, <laughs> it's impossible to equally balance those components, but I don't need to. I, I just need to make sure I'm expending my effort and energy and joy and passion where it's most needed at any given time. Yeah, beautifully said. And it's, I'm, I'm, I think if someone even has a question in the mind, I need to have better work-life balance, the, the, what it's telling them is they're miserable and they need to be doing something uh, very differently with uh, how they invest their time. So, uh, Yeah, and I love that. Now, I, I'm going to uh, switch into what I like to call the ambush series, which is the, the bushfire lightning round where I ask you Ooh. five quick questions <laughs> to get you to tap dance for me, Kate. This is scary. I feel like I'm a, a sale of the century. I'm buzzing, <laughs> buzzing. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you no time to think about it, no cigarette and no blindfold. I'm going to jump straight in here. So <laughs> okay. What's, what's your favourite quote and why? Oh, okay. So, look, this is a hard one because I feel like half the time any quote that comes out of my mouth is just something that came out of my mother's mouth 40 <laughs> years ago. But my favourite um, is a quote by Viktor Frankl is live as if you were living a second time and as though you had acted wrongly the first time. Yeah, beautiful. I I've, I've read his book and I don't remember that one. Uh, and Viktor Frankl gets a very often mention on from guests on Guinea Vesper. That's the first time I've heard that quote and that's a cracker actually. That is a cracker. Yeah, love that. Why is that important to you? Oh, I think it just it 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 so beautifully tells you to live your values. It to, so beautifully tells you to be present, to live in the moment, to live your greatest life. It it tells you to be kind, to treat people the way you want to be treated. I, it's it's just encapsulates so beautifully and so poetically the things that are probably most important to me. Yeah, love it. Let's switch into the uh, the book fraternity for a minute. And you've you've mm-hmm. written four fantastic books yourself. What, what's the top book that you'd recommend people read, and why? I I have two absolute favourites. So, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl is my absolute all time favourite book. I read that at least once a year. I always find something else in it. It mm. never ceases to kind of sadden me and amaze me so that is my favorite book my second favorite book is a series actually and it's the hillary mantel um wolf hall series um which is all about henry the eighth and and cromwell and i am just absolutely obsessed with that period of history and i think i've written uh, no i haven't written i've read every kind of book available on Henry VIII and his wives and Thomas Cromwell and that whole period of time. Um, you know, I could actually go on Sale of the Century or Mastermind and win, okay, given I'll, all my knowledge on that. Watch this space. I'm going to dob you in for that then, Kate. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> uh, now, this one's a little bit of a, a change of pace, uh, but it's something that a lot of Australians feel that they pay too much tax what's the top legal thing that you've done to minimize the tax that you pay this is going to sound really really stupid 
um, and really basic, but the best thing I've done and the top thing I've done is got a really, really excellent accountant wow. um, who understands my business and understands my priorities and my values and works and I work and invest in her. So it's not cheap, but it's absolutely worth every penny. Well, I reckon that's not not the dumbest response. That's the smartest response. And in line with your outsourcing to experts who are better at doing things that you you don't want to do so you can put your energy into other things, that's one of the smartest things that you could do. So uh, love that. Uh, now, back on the investment subject for a minute, mm-hmm. and this applies to anything. It can be time, energy, resources, money, interests. What's both the worst and the best piece of investment advice that you've ever received so far? Okay, the worst ever was um, back in the 90s at some stage when we were advised to buy into trees. <laughs> Big mistake. Your accountant Big would, would, have, would have told you that it's probably not the same accountant as you've got now, I'm guessing. It was a financial planner. Um, yeah, and let's say no more, apart from the fact that I am not a tree hugger. Um, that was that was the worst mistake. The best piece of advice, which I think applies across all facets of my life, was um, when I was at Telstra and I worked for an incredible um, boss called Greg Wynn, who was one of the three amigos that came over to Australia with Sol Trujillo. Yep. And I learned so much under his... Um, mentorship and he was a brilliant is a brilliant brilliant man his advice to me around which was specifically at that point around sort of pitching and putting business proposals together was around was data is king always he used to say and i'm not going to try his american accent but he has a beautiful deep american accent and he would say kate that data is king there, I said I wasn't going to do his accent, but I did. Very good. That was very, he's a Texan, clearly. <laughs> yeah, he was down from – he was from Arizona. So right. um, um, data is king and it's kind of a value or it's a, it's, a, it's a piece of advice that I live my life by. I don't do things without the data. I don't make decisions whether it's where I'm going to invest my time or my energy or my money without the data. Um, any pitch I'm putting to a client or um, a prospect is data-driven data is king yeah that's i mean it, you can't argue with data if it's the right data so yeah, that's uh, it. yeah and i'd love that um the final question in the series what's a personal habit that you've developed that you believe contributes most to your success today oh okay um Look, apart from, I guess, all the productivity habits, which I live and breathe by, so I won't sprout any of those because, you know, they're all in my books, you know, go buy them and read them. <laughs> um, but I guess a personal habit is, and it's a bit quirky, is that um, in 2011, we travelled around the world with our kids and we were away for 16 weeks, which was brilliant. Awesome. Um what I did before I left, one of the things I did before I left was I downloaded Stephen Fry reading the Harry Potter series because I thought, okay, this will keep the kids entertained when we're in the caravan or on the plane or whatever. For that 16 weeks, the only person in our family who listened to that Harry Potter series over and over again was me. <laughs> um, and I used to put it on and I have started falling asleep to it and at night and it was really meditative and – so since 2011, every single night when I go to bed, I turn Harry Potter on with Stephen Fry talking and I fall asleep very quickly. And if I wake up in the middle of the night at any stage, it's still him talking and I don't lie there for four hours thinking, oh, my God, the world's falling in, what's fallen through the cracks, you know, my life is this, my life is that, oh, all the alarming, oh, there's a ghost under the bed, oh, there's a monster <laughs> in the cupboard. I just listen to Harry and I go straight back to sleep. i tell you what, so that's... Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I, this is a bit freaky, but I uh, I listen to the Calm app at night to calm the calm the brain, and and Stephen Fry does a, a beautiful uh, forty minute piece on I think it's called Lavender Fields or or something where he talks about his his trip in into Provence, mm-hmm. and he has the most soothing, eloquent, easy to listen to voice yeah. uh, on the planet. I think. 
And, Absolutely. Um, and it, it's guaranteed to put you to sleep, which is no criticism of him. It's the best habit and routine that I could get in because I get consistently, you know, eight or nine solid hours of sleep every single night. Love it. Love it. Yeah, awesome. Final question, Kate, uh, in bringing it to a, a close, and this is a, a great opportunity to sum up all the gold that you've shared with us today. If I give you the microphone and that microphone speaks to every single one of the 7.7 billion people in the world that's alive today and I, I give you one minute to talk, what would you say? I would start off with the Viktor Frankl quote that I shared with you. So live as if you were living a second time and as though you had acted wrongly the first time. Be kind to each other and treat everyone the way you want to be treated yourself. Yeah. And that's it. doesn't get any more uh, pressing or significant than that. And if every single one of us adopted that philosophy of just treating everyone the way we want to be treated, the world would be a beautiful place. It is a beautiful place, but uh, uh, you don't get that impression if you're mad enough to listen to the mainstream media, unfortunately. That is awesome. Look, it's been a very enjoyable, enlightening chat, Kate. I've been looking forward to this for a long time and uh, I know the the listeners are going to get a lot of gold out of that. I'd I'd strongly suggest uh, for everyone that is looking to improve uh, the way they invest their time, uh, jump on Booktopia now and grab yourself a copy of Kate's uh, latest book. Uh, It's a must read and and putting an extra 30 hours back into helping you achieve your Uh, unfulfilled lifetime goals uh, is the best way to start it because it's what we do on a day-to-day basis that ultimately achieves the big goals long term and uh, do that Uh, for those who want to reach out and contact you uh, for all the other work that you do Kate how can they do that Uh, they can connect with me on LinkedIn or they can email me direct at kate at timestylers.com Brilliant, Kate. Thanks again. Uh, We'll be in touch again. We'd love to have you back at uh, certain times uh, if you're open to it to share uh, some other ways that people can be improving how they invest their time and and managing themselves. It's not about managing time. It's about managing ourselves at the end of the day. So I really appreciate you spending some time today. Thanks so much, Bushy. Thanks, Kate. Well, Freedom Fighters, how good was that? To get a summary of all this investment gold in the show notes, just email me on hello at khgroup.com.au. It's H-E-L-L-O at khgroup.com.au. Or check us out at www.bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. I look forward to joining you next week for another episode of the Get Invested podcast. So thanks for listening. And as always, dream as if you live forever and live as if you die.